Hey guys, so I know what kinds of things you want to see. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. All right, everybody, um, let's take another look at this Oscision Tangara commuter train that they use in and around the Sydney area. Now, I actually haven't used one of these in real life, but hopefully I will one of these days if I can make it back over there. It seems that these are actually only run in four unit sets in Australia, so I don't have to worry about getting any kind of add-in cars or anything like that to make this longer. This is the way this is gonna look, and you know, I, I like it. Again, it's, it's one of the more interesting uh, models that I have. I'm really looking forward to running it. Came with that railer that I showed you, and I'm going to show you why it came with that railer here in a little bit. So, um, yeah, if you want to see more of this, you can see the unboxing video. I'm kind of whipping through it really quick here, but let's go ahead and actually take a look at the interior of this thing. Now, before I cut into it, I want to let you know that um, I found out that this was one of the most horrific models to pull the shell off of. And you have to pull two of them off because you have to pull the rear one off if you want to get those lights working. In fact, I can honestly say that other than a lot of older steam locomotives that are, have a plastic shell that's kind of wrapped on, this is the model that I hated taking apart the most. It just feels like it's going to break. It feels like everything you do is just pulling too hard on it. And I really could not stand pulling this model apart. So um, good luck with that. There are some people who have put um, detailed um, instructions on how to take this thing apart on the internet. I'm not going to rehash those. All of them look good. All of them look scary, however. And the technique I used wasn't too dissimilar from what you're going to find on YouTube. Just hated it. Hated taking apart this model. Hated every freaking second of it. All right, here's what it looks like on the inside once you get this shell off without hopefully destroying it. I actually scratched it a little bit and scratched one of the windows. Uh, it's, again, it's terrible. Okay, it's um, nice that they give you a speaker mount, so you'll have to unscrew that if you want a sound model. And I had to start thinking about what could possibly fit in this thing. But, you know, I, I thought of a bunch of different things. I'm like, I'm not sure if you're supposed to pull some of this plastic out tried a couple different speaker sizes to figure out what might actually fit you know speakers like this one it looks like it's about the same size but it, it just doesn't work what i found actually does work were these sugar cube speakers they actually slot in there perfectly and um, there's uh, of course space for two of them there's two speaker baffles and they hold the speakers in on, on opposing sides and I've seen a couple people produce speaker baffles like this, and I've used them before, so it wasn't any big shock, but these sit in here really nicely. I ended up actually gluing mine in. I, I think, you know, there's not a lot of instructions, but that's what I've done with baffles like this before, so I figured I was pretty much on the right track. To get this done and get this running, I've chosen a Locksound 21-pin decoder, and uh, the, it's a native 21. There's no other options unless you want to use some sort of um, decoder buddy or something like that that allows you to convert a 21 pin into an 8 pin or something like that. So I figured this would work best. It looks like the model itself has enough electrical pickups not to stall out on my curves or anything. If it would have, I would have actually used probably a Tsunami and, and used um, some sort of current keeper or something like that. So here's the entire setup. The speaker attached to the lock sound decoder. Now, somebody actually said that one of the outputs somewhere actually is the speaker output. You know, I just I just didn't want to mess with it. I figured I'll just put this in there. It'll make it easy to pull the whole unit out if that's what I need to do. So there's this dummy plug in here that you're going to need to extract before putting in your own 21-pin decoder. So as soon as we get that out here, we'll be able to do that. Of course, uh, what's nice about the 21-pin decoder is it only goes in one way, so... As soon as you kind of line up the pins, which I'm trying to figure out which way they go here, should drop right in there without any problem. And then, of course, you can test it before um, you know, screwing back in the speaker housing and um, assembling this. Because I tell you, you want to make sure this works before putting the shell back on, because once you get the shell back on, you're not going to want to take it off, trust me. Once we get that in there, it's just time to screw this speaker housing back in there. And you gotta make sure, of course, that your wires are long enough. And I think the first time actually they weren't, so I had to go in and, and put in some patch wires. So just be careful of that. The standard 
lock sound wires aren't long enough, so you're gonna have to patch it in order to get it in there. So now that we have this all buttoned, we can just go ahead and screw this speaker housing back in here. No problem whatsoever. The screws are kind of small, but um, you know, the, the speaker housing actually holds them pretty well, so it's not that big of a deal once you get them in there. I talked about this in my unboxing video, but um, one of the things that I wish more premium manufacturers would do would just be to light their models right off the bat. Um, but I decided after taking this apart that I wouldn't want to light it anyway. I'd have to either run pickups from the two center cars or something like that, but they actually chose just to sort of expose all this electronics, and you can't see it, but underneath this row of seats is the motor. So if I were to light this up, you'd be able to see all that. So I decided that in the end, I just wasn't gonna light this at all. But still, I just something I wish manufacturers would do more is pretty much include lighted interiors. Standard Chinese models are all that way now. And I think right now Chinese models sort of on a pound for pound basis are I think some of the best that there are in the industry right now. Seems like it's running pretty well, so let's move on to the next step. All right, well, let's take a look at the lights now. And I'm not sure how they're supposed to work out of the box. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying that when I plug certain values into my decoder, these are the lights that turn on. When I put my decoder in and I turn on the front lights, what I get are the headlights here up top and then the ditch lights. Again, I don't know if that's how it's supposed to work, if I got a weird version, but that's how it works for me. When you activate aux one, these two marking lights show up. I guess they're to let you know that it's the front of the train, something like that. Okay, when you uh, fire up aux two, you see these two red marking lights and the blue light over this door light up. I suppose it's the end of train marker and that's to show that that's the last door on the last car. I'm not an expert on Australian trains, so it is what it is. Okay, you may be wondering what happens when you light up the rear lights. If aux two lit up the rear markers, then what about the rear lights? Well, here's what happens. Yep, that's right. Absolutely nothing happens when you light up the rear lights. This works slightly differently on here than it does my um, other Sydney commuter. My other Sydney commuter lights up the rear door light and the rear marking light. So I've seen some guys on the internet, uh, you know, be able to light up all these lights separately. I just haven't put that much time into it. I just wanted to get the decoder in there and see what happened. So there you have it. Again, I don't know if mine's right or if I'm doing it right or I got a bum version or what. If you remember, a railer came with this and I'm like, oh, that's great. I, I don't have a railer, so I'm really happy to have one. But it turns out, in fact, that if you're going to use this model, uh, a railer is fairly necessary, although I can get these on the track without one. Um, look at the skirting here. Look at how far it comes down on the track. So the reason why they gave you that railer is because trying to get these wheels on and railed properly without it can be a real chore. So if you want, you could try to stick a blade in there. Just be careful you don't short. I normally actually use non-conductive blades. Um, also, I can sort of use the walk it on technique as you're seeing here. That seems to work pretty well. In addition to how hard it is to get off the shell, one of the things I really don't like about this model are the couplers. You can see here that they're a type of, I, I guess, key and detent system, something like that, which in itself is not a terrible idea. In fact, not only is it a key and detent system, but it's a it's a biplane. That way, you know, you have to actually couple these at the right height. The thing that's really awful about these, though, is that they're very difficult to couple without some sort of external pressure. Here I've used my two fingertips to put those together, but if you stick this on the track and then try to slam the cars together, even if you do get the couplers to mate, they won't fully engage. 
and they, they just have a tendency to bend around and bend all over the place. Um, what's bad about this is you have to sort of assemble the train off of the track and then tilt it onto the track, which makes the railers that they give you completely useless. While this system does produce a really nice close couple that won't fall apart, I really hate having to assemble it off track and then kind of pry it onto track. I just don't like that at all. No matter, I still like this model a lot, and I'm going to enjoy running it quite a bit, I can tell. I'm glad that Australians and non-Australians alike have uh, the ability to enjoy their models in their own home. You know, it's going to be a while probably till I can make it back down there, although I'm trying to within the next couple of years. Joining the Tengara will be a Sydney Trains V-Set, which is also made by Oscision. I've actually had the pleasure of riding one of those in real life, and hope to again very soon. Making a cameo appearance will be a Melbourne area V-Line Velocity, which is not made by Oscision. And the one thing I like about this company, well, just look for the purple train and you'll be able to see what I like about this company's models a little bit better than Oscision. Alrighty, let's give these trains a run. I'll let them go for a while. If you're like me, I just like watching train videos or having them on in the background. I'll try to find some appropriate music to put in about halfway through. It'll be subtle, I promise. So enjoy. Let me know if you like this stuff and let me know what kinds of things you want to see by liking, commenting, and subscribing. Thanks a bunch for watching. Take care.